What if Ahsoka turned to the dark side? In her main story, Ahsoka leaves the Jedi Order, but still maintains her dedication to following the ways of the light. On one of her old videos, though, the Traveler asked what if instead Ahsoka had fallen prey to the dark side of the Force. That's what we'll be looking at in today's video. So, let's get right into it. Our story begins following Ahsoka's bitter departure from the Jedi Order after her trial for the bombing of the Jedi Temple. Ahsoka, rather than continue to hold on to her positive convictions about the galaxy and making it a better place, ends up falling deeper into a space of resentment. After leading the Order and further seeing the hypocrisy of the Jedi as she dives deeper into the bowels of Coruscant's underworld, Ahsoka's resentment continues to fester. Not only had the Jedi treated her poorly, someone who had grown up within their ranks because they needed a fall girl to report back to their precious chance, but they had also refused to acknowledge the poverty that was existing just below their noses. These were places that the Jedi were needed, not in the cushy offices of politicians. Ahsoka's resentment begins to morph into anger, and she finds herself slipping deeper and deeper into a similar disillusionment that Dooku felt upon parting with the Jedi. How does this impact the rest of our story? Let's keep going and find out. In this timeline, Ahsoka still meets Trace and Rafa Martez, but she doesn't stick around with them long. After being stabbed in the back by people with whom she'd shared walls with for her entire life, Ahsoka is hesitant to trust anyone new. She parts ways with them quickly, and she embarks upon her own path. Ahsoka turns into a loner, too embroiled in rage and frustration of what had happened in her past in order to reach out to anyone. She's a shadow of the night, constantly observing, watching, and learning about the nature of how the Republic really worked outside of the ivory tower that was the Jedi Temple that she had grown up in. One night, as Ahsoka is wandering the Undercity streets, something catches her eye. Two pikes are harassing a helpless citizen in an alleyway, pointing their weapons towards him and forcing him backwards. Ahsoka sees the look of pure terror in the eyes of this citizen who's clothed in raggedy, poverty-ridden robes, and she can't help but intervene. She stands behind the pikes, telling them to let this man go. The two pikes turn towards her, initially scoffing at her attempts to deter them from their prey. Ahsoka says that she's dealt like people with these two in the past, and that she was going to give them one last warning to leave. Once again, the pikes simply laugh, pointing their blasters in her direction. It is in this moment that for the first time since descending into the lower levels of Coruscant that Ahsoka finally decides to capitalize on the negative emotions that she'd been feeling as a result of her departure from the Jedi. She lashes out, force choking both of the pikes. They begin to plead with her, asking for mercy. Ahsoka, after having been down in the trenches for a few weeks now, knew that these pikes would just go back to the same old lifestyles that they had been living before if she let them go. So, she continues to hold them until they fall to the ground in lifeless heaps. The man runs away, thanking Ahsoka for her help. Once again, Ahsoka departs into the night, again becoming a shadow. Ahsoka realizes that what she had just done was forbidden by Jedi teachings. However, at the same time, she knows that her actions had probably just saved that man's life. It seemed that the dark side could be used for good. Something that the Jedi couldn't seem to grasp. They feared anyone who thought differently from them, which Ahsoka could see clearly now. Really, who cared what side of the Force someone used if they were making a difference in the greater galaxy? From this moment forward, Ahsoka was much more willing to tap into her negative emotions if she was using them to help someone else. Ahsoka continues to take on the criminals in the underbelly of the galactic metropolis. She catches many criminals off guard as they're trying to collect debts, steal drugs, or rough up some poorer workers in the streets. She kills many of these criminals, especially ones that she knows work for the organized crime syndicate, and whispers of her reputation begin to spread. Ahsoka gains a name for herself. The citizens refer to her as the mysterious stranger, someone who comes and goes, saving those in need and taking on the corruption that the police of the upper city were unwilling to even look at. However, nobody knows who she is or why she's doing what she does. Many are inspired by her actions and they look to her as a sign of hope. Ahsoka realizes that finally, by using the dark side of the Force, she's actually helping the galaxy, not just the rich politicians. In addition to that, it's an intoxicating feeling, the rush of expelling all of her negative emotion and betrayal from the past. Finally, 
Ahsoka was actually making a difference in the lives of the common people. After taking out some high-profile gang bosses of the Black Sun, whom she'd caught engaging in an illegal arms trafficking deal during one of her nighttime patrols, she begins to catch the attention of the leaders of the organized criminal empires that operate heavily on the galactic capital. During this time, Maul is continuing to further the influence of the Shadow Collect, and during one of his meetings with his criminal underlings, Zaton Maj mentions that he's becoming frustrated by this anonymous vigilante. He is the leader of the Black Sun at this time. It was a passing comment not meant to be taken seriously. However, Maul latches onto this, firing further. Zatan and some of the other leaders tell Maul that there was a masked force user running around through the streets killing their people, and Maul is intrigued. He believes that this individual could be a valuable asset to him, and he orders that the factions work together to set up a trap. They begin to spread whispers throughout the Coruscant underworld about a massive pike spice shipment that would be coming into one of the lower city ports, and they set the stage for Soka, hoping that she'll show up to combat it. Naturally, the ex-Jedi keeps her ear to the ground, and she hears the rumors circulating through the population. When she arrives at the location, the various families of the Shadow Collective are ready. When Ahsoka drops in and begins to kill the pike guards, the others spring the trap. Ahsoka is agile, darting in and out of the shadows quickly, but she soon sees that she's outmatched by the sheer number of enforcers from the Pikes, Black Sun, the Hutts, Crimson Dawn, and even a few Maldalorians. She almost escapes the setup, but the Maldalorians are able to keep up with her by using their specially designed equipment that was meant to deal with Jedi, and they end up catching her. Because Ahsoka doesn't have her lightsabers, she's at a significant disadvantage with the Maldalorians, and she is eventually outmatched and knocked unconscious with a stun bolt. Ahsoka, however, didn't go down without a fight. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this story, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications as we update this channel weekly with new What If content. Now, back to the story. When Ahsoka wakes up, she is in a jail cell at the bottom of Maul's palace, Mandalore. Maul is there, outside of the cell door, waiting for her. He stands with his hands behind his back, well postured, and begins to pace back and forth, remarking about how long it had taken her to come to consciousness. Ahsoka hadn't met Maul before, but she remembers hearing stories from Kenobi about this horned devil. She reaches out with the Force, attempting to choke him, but Maul merely chuckles and throws her towards the back of the cell, hard. Ahsoka collapses to the floor, breathing heavily. Maul tells her that there's no point in resisting, and that he had heard great things about her. He extends the offer to join him, because the two weren't so different. Each of them were trying to make a difference in the galaxy, and each of them had been betrayed by those who had raised them. Maul says that he can sense Ahsoka's hatred, and that he knows she's only using a fraction of her power. He needs a new apprentice after the death of his brother, and he sees that Ahsoka also acknowledges the hypocrisy of both the Jedi and the Sith. Together, they could forge a new order for themselves, one that would enact true justice on those who had wronged him. Initially, Ahsoka spits back at Maul that he's no better than the Jedi, hypocritical by acting with criminals to consolidate more power for himself. Maul simply laughs, telling Ahsoka that if she could only see what he had seen, then she would be in alignment with his vision. Maul explains that the criminals are merely a means to an end, a way for him to balance the coming reign of terror that his former master would enact on the galaxy. Once again, Maul extends the offer to Ahsoka to join him. Ahsoka, planning on betraying Maul, ends up agreeing, hoping that she can get close to this demon before finally ending up destroying his criminal empire for good. In our timeline, since Ahsoka isn't present for Bo-Katan to reach out to, she goes directly to Obi-Wan Kenobi, asking for help in reclaiming Mandalore from Maul, thinking that his dedication to Satine would prompt him to act. However, as usual, Obi-Wan's devotion to the Jedi Order, thus to their politics, has him going to free the Chancellor from the Separatist kidnapping on Coruscant. Anakin, who has become slightly frustrated with the war and the politics of the Senate, says that he can take the 501st to Mandalore himself and try to remedy this situation. After all, in all reality, they only needed one more Jedi at the capital. Anakin felt that he could better be used elsewhere. Beyond that, he could also sense something drawing him to Mandalore like the Force was guiding him there for a reason that he couldn't yet see. 
Obi-Wan remarks that neither the Council nor the Chancellor would like this move, but that in the end, it was Anakin's decision. Anakin says that he feels like he needs to go to Mandalore, and Obi-Wan respects this, telling him that Qui-Gon would be proud of his dedication to following the Call of the Force. The two part ways, and Anakin sets course for Mandalore with Bo-Katan and the 501st, prepared for whatever was to come their way. This was where the fun would truly begin with Anakin Skywalker and his former Padawan, Ahsoka Tano. When Anakin and the 501st emerge from hyperspace with Wolf Yularen's Republic fleet, Anakin immediately senses a familiar presence. He's racked with old feelings, emotions, and memories, and his sense hits him like a wave. In that moment, Anakin knows why the Force had sent him to Mandalore. His old apprentice was here. Ahsoka feels a similar response when Anakin's presence hits her. She remembers that Anakin had been the only Jedi who had stood up for her in the face of the Council's hypocrisy. While he had gone about it in a way that had reinforced their teachings, begging Ahsoka to turn herself in, at least Anakin had tried, and he maintained faith in her innocence long after everyone else had given up hope. It had, in fact, been Anakin who had tracked down Barriss Offee and imprisoned her, with the help of the Temple Guards. Maybe, if she told Anakin about the good that she'd been doing in the galaxy, he would join her. Perhaps together, they could take down Maul. The Siege of Mandalore begins in much the same way as it did in the Clone Wars. Maul's puppet ruler, Prime Minister Almec, expresses outrage at the Republic's intervention, before saying that he'll defend his city with whatever force is necessary. Anakin leads the 501st and the Night Owls into battle, dropping them in via jetpack to attack Sindari. Anakin, Rex, and Bo-Katan end up killing many of the Maldalorians in the sky, effectively securing a route to the city for the incoming troops. There are plenty of clones who fall to the ruthless fighting of the Maldalorians, but the Republic still manages to push past them due to their numbers and the sizable amount of landing craft, starfighters, and weaponry that they possess. Anakin lands with Rex and Bo, and they end up pushing further into Sundar, forcing the Maldalorians to retreat. Maul and Ahsoka, who had been in the throne room with Almec, flee with their troops into the sewers of Sundari, leaving Almec to fend for himself in typical Maul fashion. Almec is quickly defeated by Anakin and Bo, who throw him in the dungeon where he had been held before. Anakin can still feel Ahsoka's presence, and he wants to go out and search for her with Rex. Bo says that she will stay with the Night Owls and guard the upper city in case of an attack from the Maldalorians or any of the criminal syndicates that Maul was aligned with. Anakin leaves Jesse in charge of the remaining clones on the surface, and he dives deep into the sewers with his longtime clone friend, Rex. Meanwhile, Maul and Ahsoka wait to spring a trap on the incoming Jedi and clones, just like Maul does in the Clone Wars. Ahsoka meditates, breathing heavily, waiting for her master to arrive. Maul tells her that Anakin, the Jedi who was coming to deal with them, was one of the keys to Darth Sidious' plan that he had seen in his vision. Ahsoka, just like in the Clone Wars, denies this, telling Maul that Anakin was good at heart. Maul, however, tells her that it doesn't matter because soon they would have him in their clutches and that they would either turn him to the dark side against Sidious or they would kill him and destroy the grand plan of the Sith. Ahsoka still wants to betray Maul and she hopes that Anakin would help her achieve this goal. Eventually, Anakin and the clones spring the trap. Anakin is trapped in the small sewer enclave with Ahsoka and Maul, and they circle him, eager to hear what he will say to their proposal. Rex's group of clones is cut off by the Maldalorians, led by Gar Saxon, who are hiding out with Maul in the sewers, allowing for the criminal mastermind to have his way with Anakin. Maul cackles, pleased to see that Anakin had followed him into the sewers. He says that he can see why his old master wanted to make Anakin his apprentice, because Maul can sense his prowess in the Force. Maul asks if this was truly the same little boy that he had been watching on Tatooine all those years ago, marveling at Anakin's growth since then. Anakin looks dead into Maul's eyes, asking what he wants, and what he had done to his former apprentice. Ahsoka stands there, merely watching, just as she had learned to do on the streets of Coruscant. Maul tells Anakin about the grand plan, and that he had seen visions of what was to come. Anakin doesn't believe him especially since he still thinks that Palpatine is a good man. Maul laughs at the lack of foresight from the once great Jedi Order, remarking about how far it had fallen. Maul gestures at Ahsoka, 
saying that she had seen the hypocrisy of the Jedi and believed in consolidating power in order to take some away from the coming darkness that would descend upon the galaxy. Maul extends his hand to Anakin, asking him if he would join their growing coalition and help them fight the coming shroud of evil that would soon envelop the galaxy. To this, Anakin simply ignites his lightsaber and charges towards Maul, who counters him with his double-bladed saber. Their duel had begun. Anakin and Maul dance together, parrying each other's blows as the clones continue to approach their position, gradually taking down the Maldalorian protectors. Maul continues to taunt Anakin, telling him to give in to his hatred further and to join him. Anakin leans into his aggression, enraged by what this man had twisted his former apprentice into. He pushes Maul backwards, hammering him with blow after blow. Eventually, Anakin disarms Maul, but Maul throws him back with a force in response. As Anakin is recovering, Maul tells Ahsoka that they need to finish Anakin off and that they need to destroy Anakin in order to delay and possibly even annihilate the master plan for the return of Sidious's Sith. Ahsoka, though, is moved by the return of her old master and she's unable to follow through with Maul's demands. Instead, she stands in front of Anakin, saying that she still has faith in his goodness. She taps into her anger once again, pushing Maul back towards the wall, just as he had done to Anakin. It's important to note here that Maul isn't defeating Anakin. He merely was distracted by Ahsoka while Anakin was recovering from a blow that Maul had thrown him into the wall with. Anakin is still more powerful than Maul, and had Maul not stepped in and tried to engage Ahsoka in this conflict, I thoroughly believe Anakin would won. Anyway, back to the story. She then lifts Maul into the air, taking him off guard by force choking him. Maul, who wasn't expecting this betrayal due to his focus on his grander vision, has legitimate fear in his eyes for the first time in a very long time. For once, something had happened that he hadn't anticipated. Anakin tells Ahsoka to stop once he gets back on his feet, that Maul could be of good use to the Republic. At this, she laughs. Mocking Anakin's devotion to a flawed government led by a corrupt head of state, she continues to choke Maul, digging deeper into his neck. Maul's eyes begin to roll back into his head, and Anakin pleads with her one more time not to do this. Ahsoka doesn't listen. She kills Maul, looking into her master's eyes, and tells him that she appreciated his care for her. However, she had her own path now one that wasn't characterized by another aspect of the Force that the Jedi had been blind to. Anakin is distraught, and he was hoping that his Padawan would have been able to come back to the light, that he could have knocked some sense into her. Anakin asks why she had stood up for him like that, to which Ahsoka replies that he had been the only Jedi who had stood up for her when she was falsely accused. She asks Anakin if he wants to join her on her journey across the galaxy to truly understand the freedom of the Force outside of the Order. Anakin is tempted, but he declines her offer. He still feels like he has a duty to the galaxy as a Jedi, and that he simply couldn't abandon that to pursue his personal desires. At this, Ahsoka shakes her head, remarking that she hopes that one day their paths would cross again. Then. Ahsoka runs away through the tunnels in the opposite direction from the approaching clone soldiers. Anakin merely stands, dumbfounded, slightly shocked by what had just happened. As Anakin's clone contingent pours in, securing and capturing some of the remaining Maldalorians, Anakin gazes back at the tunnel, wondering what would become of his prodigal apprentice. After Mandalore, Anakin returns to Coruscant. On his way back, he contacts Obi-Wan, who informs him that he had defeated General Grievous on Utapah, and that Dooku had been captured by him, Windu, and Master Yoda when they had escaped Grievous's flagship unscathed. He also told Anakin that he neutralized Grievous on Utapah, and that the Republic intelligence had stumbled across information stating that key Separatist leaders were convening on Mustafar in order to figure out next steps. A squad of clone commandos had been dispatched to deal with him, according to Obi-Wan, as Anakin was not present on Coruscant for Palpatine to manipulate to the dark side during this time, delaying his plan slightly. Dooku was scheduled to testify before the Senate in a day's time, and Anakin said that he hoped he could be present for whatever was unveiled. Upon his arrival on Coruscant, Anakin is immediately greeted by Chancellor Palpatine, who invites him to sit with him during the testimony from Dooku. Anakin, 
having never had been offered this honor before, gladly accepts. Palpatine tells him that whatever Dooku was about to say would probably be completely false and that he shouldn't listen to him. He also tells Anakin that he's heard whispers in the time that he was on Mandalore about how there were plots by the Jedi Council to overthrow him and install their own government, especially with the end of this war coming, and thus the end of their military power. Anakin tells Palpatine that he doesn't believe anything like this could ever happen, because most of the Jedi were good people. Palpatine says that he hopes that this isn't the case, but that he was starting to believe it due to how suspicious they had been acting with him lately. Anakin watches as Dooku comes forward and spins his testimony in handcuffs, telling the Senate his tale. He says that he never truly wanted any of this to happen, but that the corrupt Republic had forced him and like-minded political idealists to act with violence. He also informs him of Palpatine's treachery, which many senators are shocked by. Some of them, who had seen Palpatine's strange, seemingly needless prolongment of the war, actually found themselves starting to believe Dooku, and the Senate is thrown into chaos. Even Anakin is stunned, but Palpatine tells him to take none of this seriously. It was all political theater. He leans over to Anakin and tells him that this was part of the Jedi plan. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, Ahsoka continues her work of dismantling the crime syndicates. As someone who's seen as a major player now, she forms her own faction to compete in the power vacuum that's created by the fall of Maul in the Shadow Collective. Hers, however, isn't dedicated to any of the criminal enterprises of the others. Instead, rather than be a criminal organization, it's more of a pseudo-police force of individuals who were inspired by Ahsoka's actions on Coruscant and who had heard tales of her taking down Maul. They joined together to keep the other criminals in line, ensuring that they did not abuse their populations. And if they did, they would be hearing from Ahsoka and her gang. Even though the Republic manages to subdue the Separatists, new threats rise. Palpatine must fight to maintain his chancellorship. People become suspicious of the Jedi due to their continued involvement in politics following the end of the war. Dooku's ideology lives on despite his defeat, leading to many more progressive senators demanding representation for their worlds in the Senate. Even Anakin, who once wanted to serve the galaxy, is now torn by his allegiances to Padme, Palpatine, and the Republic, along with the Jedi Order. Beyond that, in the far reaches of the galaxy, Ahsoka continues to move in the shadows, using her dark side force powers to combat the evils of the criminal underworld. However, the more that she does this, the more that she begins to slip down into a path of no return. Palpatine, hearing of her exploits, takes note, knowing that if anything failed with Anakin, at least there was another out there who could possibly take his place one day if he did not agree to his apprentice. It was a time of uncertainty for the galaxy. Soon, however, things would surely be made clear. Hi there everyone, I really hope that you enjoyed today's what if scenario. If you did, please think about checking out this other video. What if Bo-Katan defeated Maul for the Darksaber? Have a blessed day folks, and as always, I hope that you've had your daily dose of Bantha Stew.